Hello and welcome to the Ship Shape Podcast, a series of podcasts where we meet amazing people and talk about their experiences, personal, technical, and all related to the maritime world. Come and dive in, dive in. Today on the Ship Shape Podcast, we speak with Captain Jorn Blangelen, founder and CEO of the Eco Clipper, a sustainable way of shipping. Your two co-hosts today are Meryl Charette, I'm a live aboard on a Tashing Toshiba 36 in Boston, Massachusetts, and T. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, this is Talhab Hate, and uh, we have a great guest on today. Jorn, welcome to the show. Where are you uh, coming to us from? So, uh, yeah, right here in Den Helder, in, um, well, the Venice of the North in the Netherlands. Yeah, it's actually um, a place where we are currently refitting the Tucker, which is the first ship we are launching with the Eco Clipper uh, company to uh, start transporting goods emission free. It's a sailing ship, so um, totally propelled by uh, wind power. I'm currently on a sail loft because it's a nice, quiet place to talk. But uh, yeah, down here, it's the blacksmith uh, workshop and out there is wood workshop and the ship is laying out there. More ships are there in the middle of the of the port here. And before we get into your background of how you even got into this, let's talk about the Netherlands a little bit. Netherlands mm. is known for being such a marine related industry. Can you talk a little bit on the legacy that you come from? Yeah, well... Actually, the Netherlands, half of the Netherlands is below sea level. We have many ports here, many channels and uh, many ships. I lived for a little while in Ireland, in the west of Ireland, and decided to come back to the Netherlands when I found the Eco Clipper uh, because of the business environment in shipping and trading. Yeah, the Netherlands, of course, has been somewhat famous for that, I guess. It's a minuscule country. It's so small, you can't even think about it uh, in the States, I guess. But um, <laughs> but still, it's, uh, it's quite influential in the sense that it has like the largest European port, uh, Rotterdam, in it. Basically, it's a country, but it's also a, a port by itself. And then there's the port of Amsterdam, of course, and there's this huge history which, yeah, not all the aspects we can be very proud of, but uh, some of them uh, definitely. This huge history of sailing. Uh, yeah, in the beginning, of course, there was a lot of trading with the Baltic, but then later on, like in the 16th and 17th century, there was trading uh, further uh, filled to uh, to the Caribbean and to Asia. Yeah, that's some history where um, mm. I guess uh, the Netherlands is, is famous or infamous for. <laughs> and so... Was history, I mean, history is one thing that maybe attracts most sailors is I found that in common, right? But like, let's start at the beginning of your history. Where where does this all start? Were you always on the ocean growing up? Did this happen later on in life? Where does it all begin? So, yeah, it was really for me when I was a kid, I was really dreaming about this horizon. And also my family is kind of a family of seafarers and ship owners. So, yeah, I would be on the... Uh, birthday parties and stuff my uncles would be there they would be ships officers or captains or so and i'd be hearing their stories one of them i asked also like would it be possible to take me along uh, one time actually it happened that when i was uh, still going to school i was like 12 years old or so he called my father and said i'm now in rotterdam with my ship and i'm bound for copenhagen around uh, through the north sea would your son be uh, interested <laughs> to join for a few no weeks? way how how old yeah, were you at yeah. this point i was 12 oh boy and, um, this is like a great yeah, adventure this, at age was, 12 no, yeah it was like a small cargo ship about uh, 700 tons or so yeah we're loading um loading like steel But it was also, I was still going to school, so my parents had to ask my uh, school teacher if I was allowed to go. So they called him, and when he heard the story, he said like, yeah, of course he should go. He'll probably learn more at sea than he will. 100%. 100%. Send me off. (laughs) Uh I love it. Okay, so that's where it begins for you. You're like, okay. And then, but like, did you know it was going to become a lifelong passion at that point? Like, did it take over like that? Or were you like, oh, this is cool, but... I don't know, maybe... No, I wanted to become an architect. Right? Maybe become an architect, right? 
Okay, okay. So at 12, this happens. Then? So what happened? I just uh, joined because of the adventure. First night at sea, terribly seasick. Waves coming over the over the hatches and everything. Like, total <laughs> different world. I couldn't understand what was going on. Mm. And... Uh, it's almost like a virus. You are on the ship and mm. it's just, you are such in a different world. And then we were going to Denmark, going through the Kieler Canal. And it was midwinter, actually. It was like freezing cold out there. Yeah, best so introduction. We, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was like a direct laugh there. <laughs> mm. But yeah, after that, I continued um yeah, in the school holidays, then uh, to sail with my uncle, went like trips to Poland and to Sweden. This was like in the summer holidays then. But at a certain point, I was kind of like, yeah, but always sailing with your family, it's not so serious. Like I wanted to sail on a ship and a shipping company, which was not owned by my family. So I asked my father <laughs> to call some other <laughs> shipping companies. Then, then I was like 15 or so. But he was calling like through all the different Dutch shipping companies, but they wouldn't get me on board because I was too young. They were like, yeah, it's not uh, allowed. When you're 15, you can't go to sea in these times uh, yet. But almost at the end of calling through this booklet he had, he got like um, a shipbroker's firm. They were working with a couple of ships who are foreign flagged, and one of them was Cyprus flag. This ship was just uh, uh, loading a cargo in Rotterdam then bound for the Mediterranean, for Italy. And, and are these uh, sailing vessels? Is this a sailing vessel? This was cargo, a, a motor cargo ship. Okay. This was in the 90s. And in those days, there were very, very few, almost no sailing vessels. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't aware of any sailing vessels back then. So it were, uh, it were motor cargo vessels, yeah. And, there, and this one on the Cyprus flag was about 3,000 tons, which mm. is... Um, like a hundred trucks or so, something like that. Uh, but uh, we were with a very small crew there. And my uh, my parents brought me to the port of Rotterdam. Yeah, when I arrived there and the captain, he was there and he really looked like a pirate. He had his working clothes with all like dirty and, and kind of holes in it and all. And he is like the captain of this big, big ship. And he comes down and he looks at my parents. He first looks at me and then he looks at my parents. And he talks to my father and he's like, yeah, he's really small huh? and he's really young. <laughs> Are you sure uh, he's going he's gonna to join on this voyage? Because yeah. uh, he needs to know that uh, I don't believe in seasickness. So if he becomes seasick, he, he just needs to continue working uh, mm. because we don't have any people on board here as a passenger mm. and they just need to continue working. So, uh, yeah, my parents asked me and I'm like, yeah, yeah, no problem. I, I go really? anywhere. <laughs> really? But you had some and, experience uh, under your belt already, right? So you, you had you gotten no, over your seasickness? No, Was it actually all in the mind? happened. What happened? So here we go out to sea, Rotterdam. Beautiful, beautiful weather. Summer day, mm. huh? It's it. It just became a school holiday, and uh, we well, you don't really sail. Huh? You, we motored out, and uh, mm. it's summer weather. But we're going through the North Sea. It was not getting night, so I was going to bed, and then the next morning I woke up, and we were in the English Channel, motoring south. And it was beautiful weather, like blue sky all over the place, and. Uh, nice sunshine and there was like a real gentle swell so the ship was moving gently on the swell mm. and i was really seasick <laughs> i could see that coming <laughs> oh boy okay so it wasn't and, just uh, all in the mind okay then no it wasn't so nice so then yeah. um yeah then what actually happened yeah i just had to continue working but uh <laughs> but it was like this Yikes. that uh, the working hours were like something like from eight in the morning till 10 and then there was a 15 minute coffee break and then at 12 o'clock there was lunch time for an hour and then we would work till three o'clock or so for another 15 minute coffee break and then till five or 5 30 or so and then the working day was over so mm. what I did, I would just work during those working hours and do rough chipping and painting and whatever needed to be done, being really seasick. But then when I had a break, a coffee break or a lunch break or whatever break, I would go into my bunk and be seasick. <laughs> so after a few days, here we're crossing the Bay of Biscay, beautiful weather, but I'm, I'm seasick. But in a few days I woke up 
and I'm like, whoa, they didn't wake me up for work. I need to run for the deck. So I ran to the deck and I'm like passing the mess room and there the crew is sitting all in the mess room. They're like having a drink or watching some movies. I'm like, what's going on? Is there no work to be done? Mm -hmm. They're like, well, yeah, but it's eight o'clock at night. So because I had continued like sleeping so much and mm -hmm. trying to be seasick, I had totally mixed up the hours. Wow. Um, but I, I wow. continued being seasick yeah. until... Um, <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> at but a so certain did, point... It did working take your mind off it though? Or are you still like seasick while working as well? Yeah, well, this is actually a good question because mm. <laughs> the captain, he of course was this old uh, shellback and he had a very good idea for me to get rid of my seasickness. So he gave me uh, two buckets and he sent me with those buckets into the engine room. One bucket was to puke in and the other bucket had some gas oil in it, some, some marine diesel oil and a brush. So I could clean the big engine filters with this uh, marine diesel oil sitting next to the engine, <laughs> like this yeah. huge... Uh, yeah, like 2000 yeah. kilowatt engine engine yeah. room and, and here i am with two buckets one bucket to puke and one bucket to yeah. clean these filters it's like, yeah here's something to keep your mind off it yeah oh boy. but this was just the beginning of course and <laughs> and you you managed after all of this to continue being mm. in the shipping industry so what what is the well, progression I, I wanted to stop it of course but yeah. <laughs> it kept dragging me in <laughs> So after this voyage, uh, well, I was actually, I was uh, going to go to Nautico College. Uh, but when we arrived in Italy, I called my parents and said, well, no Nautico College for me. I'm mm. uh, <laughs> maybe cancel that school. I'm going to do something else. Wow. And then, of course, I want to leave the ship in Italy. But the captain said, no, you can't leave here because you signed on to the ship's articles. And it's a huge hassle to get you from board. Uh, it's not possible with customs, etc." So you'll stay on board. Mm. So that was done. And uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. so I, uh, yeah, I continued with him back to the Netherlands again. But the nice thing was, and this was kind of like a game changer, I could say, is that I kind of got used to the seasickness a little bit better. So I started when I was sitting in the wheelhouse. Wheelhouse was kind of like a living room on these small coastal cargo ships. We would be sitting in the wheelhouse and I would have paper with me and I'm drawing like sailing ships. Because these sailing ships I saw in books of my father. And my father was like really uh, collecting like uh, maritime books and stuff. So I was quite inspired about sailing ships. I really wanted to sail on sailing ships. But I didn't know that that existed still to work commercially. Mm. So I was making drawings of these sailing ships. And this captain came to me one day and he said like, well, it seems like you're not so comfortable on motor ships here. Um, but uh, they... they did you know there is like a fleet of sailing passenger ships who operate from the Netherlands? They also look for mariners and maybe that would be uh, something for you. Because if you're on a sailing ship with the sails kind of steadying, it might be a bit easier. So yeah, I didn't forget that. And mm. when I returned to the Netherlands, I kind of did some different uh, schooling. But when I was 18 and I was done with the schooling, yeah, the sea was longing, of course. But I had remembered that there were these sailing ships. And it is true that in the Netherlands, there's about 400, well, back then it maybe was even a bit more, about 400 big steel sailing barges who sail with passengers. They're like converted old sailing cargo ships, converted to passenger use. Within the Netherlands, it's quite a small country. So the town I was born was is Delft. And the, one of the ports where these sailing ships operated from is Harlingen. And it's about, uh, it's a couple of hours drive to the north. So I hitchhiked uh, to Harlingen and walked along the Keys to talk to the different skippers and captains of these sailing vessels to ask if they had uh, a berth vacant for some uh, sailor. And then I found a ship which was my first sailing ship, actually, to uh, sign on to. Um, mm. Do you remember the name? Schooner, the the Kohinoor, she was called. Kohinoor. Uh, oh, that's nice. Wow. She was originally uh, built as a sailing cargo ship in, uh, in Denmark, maybe the north of Germany. And she was built out of steel from old boilers of big steamships. So, yeah, here I was on the, on the Kohinoor. 
which was basically just sailing in the Netherlands, but also sometimes going on the North Sea. And I noticed on these sailing ships, this was my first time sailing, I actually um, didn't uh, really get so much seasick anymore. So that's that was a good start uh, working that's on cool. sailing ships. Wait, wait, wait. So motor, as soon as you made that jump, so your body was literally like telling you, this is not for you, this is not for you, this is not for you. And then you get in tune with the waves on a sailing vessel and life is good. No, no more. You would say so, huh? You would say so. Really? <laughs> Zero. Just from yeah. like everyday seasick to no seasick. Well, wow. yeah, actually, the past 20 years or so, I've never been seasick. Wow. And I've, <laughs> yeah, I got some storms Dude, going. You should, <laughs> you should get the Nobel Prize for sailing or something, you know, like for figuring that one out. Nice. Okay, so um, let's start talking about how you came up with Eco Clippers. So, what was the progression that made you realize this opportunity? So yeah, actually, um, I continued sailing. Saw like a documentary about a sailing cargo ship, which was still operating in the Caribbean, uh, the schooner Aventure. So yeah, tell us a little bit more course, about the schooner. What's a schooner? So schooner is a sailing ship with at least uh, two masts. And uh, usually the, um, the foremast is slightly lower than the mainmast. You can have schooners up to uh, seven masted uh, schooners, which was the biggest uh, ever. So actually, uh, one of those schooners, a uh, two-masted schooner, was still trading in the Caribbean in the 90s under uh, the command of Captain Paul Wahlen. And somehow I got uh, on board there as well. So uh, firsthand, I could experience the possibility of using sail power for transport. And this was also because when I was sailing on this Koinor schooner, I really liked the sailing, but the passenger part and just kind of sailing from A to B with just people. Yeah, I didn't really see the point of it so much. Yeah, I just like to carry cargo. What sort of credentials did you need to sort of land this job in this giant on this giant sailing vessel? Th this was this was uh, last century, huh? Yeah, you could just still sail without any papers. Like the, especially in the Caribbean, there was like many ships just trading, just trading, and and you could just come to a ship and you could say, well, okay, I'd, I'd like to become a crew member and uh, maybe work first a little bit to show that that you had the right hands, and then uh, yeah, you could <laughs> just go. But nowadays, it's totally different. Like everything is uh, regulated and um, it's a lot, a lot more difficult, of course, to land a job on a sailing vessel. But there is uh, many tall ships nowadays and you can book like a trip on there and kind of then you pay actually to get experience. <laughs> and then at a certain the point side. when you have done that for a while, then, yeah. Uh, yeah, then you might have the possibility to, to start sailing somewhere. There's still kind of the short track, and that would be to go like in springtime to the Netherlands and try to find a job on one of these passenger sailing vessels who are sailing in the Netherlands. And mm. then you're not really sailing at sea because usually they stay in the inshore waters on the big lakes in the Netherlands. But it's a very nice place to learn sailing and, and to get experience. And then when you have done that like half a year or so, then it becomes a lot easier to find a job on a seagoing uh, ship. Also, what works really good is joining um, a refit team and just go on a refit of a sailing ship and helping out. And then at a certain point, the ship needs to go to sea. And sometimes there's still some uh, burn birds available. And then if you're lucky and if you're the best, then the captain might choose you to join. That's a good tip. That's a good tip. So this actually, so what you just spoke about was like sort of where you'd ended up. You figured out, okay, sailing's for me and you figured out I want to, I want to do cargo and then, yeah. but you still haven't like built your own first boat or any of that. That hasn't started, right? No, I, I sailed on some, uh, some other ships in between. And then in 2000, I was, uh, well, I also went to Nautico College then. There's a beautiful, really nice Nautico College here in the Netherlands. It's called the Enkhuizer School or the Enkhuizer Nautico College. And nowadays, they also give like classes in English. So it's possible for international students to go there as well. Mm -hmm. And it gives like a course of about 20 weeks, the winter time that the sailing ships are sometimes laid up anyway. And then you get like your uh, your license for a mate on coastal uh, uh, sailing vessels. And you can do a second year and then you get your license for a mate on 
our master on uh, ocean going uh, sailing vessels so this is actually the the course i did and when i was going to that school i actually ended up on the three-masted bark europa crossing the atlantic ocean from cadiz to bermuda and then to uh, norfolk mm. virginia uh, mm. So this was like an ocean crossing. And uh, after that, there was like the tall ship events along the East Coast. I kind of joined those and jumped ship in Halifax. And there was another ship there. I signed on to the Picton Castle. Maybe you, you've heard of her. She's quite famous because she, yeah, she sailed already like, I don't know, like 10 times around the world or so. She's mm. three-masted bark. You might mm. be asking, what is a bark? <laughs> <laughs> it's like... Um, a ship with minimum three masts, with the aft mast uh, fore and aft rigged, and the main mast and the fore mast square rigged. And if you have like a three masted bark, and then a four masted bark would be a ship with four masts, with the aft mast fore and aft rigged, and the, the main mast, the um, basically the other, <laughs> the other mm. three masts square rigged. <laughs> Um, wow. So this is like one of those classic sort of iconic pictures almost, if you can imagine, right? Of like yeah, t- t- yeah, square totally. masses. Yeah, sales, it's right? kind of the final transition of mm. the most efficient sailing cargo ship is a bark. Yeah, really. <laughs> but um, so I, I joined this bark, uh, Picton Castle uh, in, uh, in Halifax. And then, uh, yeah, we did the Great Lakes tour, actually. Going all all down the um, St. Lawrence Seaway and and up to the lakes. And then, um, yeah, ending up in Chicago and we jumped ship there. I stayed for about half a year there and built another boat uh, in um, Mm. uh, So you're building boats. How did you get into that part though? Like what called you to that? Was it just like, oh, this is what I got to do now? Like what will happen there? Well, yeah, if you really want to know it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, so we were actually uh, on the, the Atlantic crossing. I met, uh, well, which became two friends and later companions in, uh, or like co-founders. But those two friends, one of them, when we arrived in Norfolk, he hitchhiked to South America, to Peru, because he had a friend there and he needed to help to build um, a youth hostel there on the beach. And we stayed on the ship. But we were kind of dreaming about sail cargo because we thought, okay, that would be a cool thing to build a sailing cargo ship maybe in South America because plenty of wood there and you can go on the beach and it would be kind of an awesome thing to do. But yeah, we need to go there. And we were kind of brainstorming what the best way would be to go down to South America. And when we arrived on the Great Lakes, we were already on the Bark uh, Picton Castle and we were thinking, well, maybe we can actually join her for a round the world trip, but it didn't really work out. And we thought, well, maybe we should go over land somehow to South America. And we, we were thinking about getting horses to uh, to go down <laughs> yeah, as far as possible. Mm. But then we realized when we were entering with the Picton Castle in South Haven, Michigan, there was like a maritime museum there and there was very friendly people. And we met some of the local uh, managers of D&W and they were like, yeah, it was cool what you guys are doing. And we're kind of telling our stories. And then we thought, well, maybe we can just build a raft and, and <laughs> sail down the Mississippi with it. Yeah, because then we're all the way south already. And uh, we, we proposed that to them. They're yeah. like, yeah, right. That, that might be a good idea. Our daughter just uh, left home. Uh, we have a room available. So if you guys want to stay here to build your raft, then you're very welcome. Yeah. So when you say you raft, step away. what does raft mean? Like like some some wooden structure which floats <laughs> so oh, you yeah, can okay. paddle <laughs> down a river or so. <laughs> And um, okay, okay. so yes. we we couldn't leave the Picton Castle right away because, yeah, you, you can't just say, OK, well, bye bye. So we had to go another port. So we went to Chicago and there we jumped ship and we took the Greyhound back to uh, South Haven. And we actually stood on the doorstep of these people and we're like, yeah, here we are. <laughs> we're going to build this raft. We're here to build the raft. And, uh, <laughs> and they're like, yeah, welcome, come in. And then we went to the local maritime museum. And we asked them, do you maybe uh, have a workshop? We need to build a raft to sail down the Mississippi. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they, they had a beautiful workshop where they built like canoes and stuff. The Petnose boat shed. 
and we were invited to make use of it. And when we saw this workshop, we were like, wow, this is a big, big workshop. <laughs> you make more than a doors. raft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're right on my page here. <laughs> so we are measuring these doors and we are like, yeah, yeah we are not going to build a raft. We're going to build a boat here. And so the doors were like 12 feet wide and 12 feet tall and stuff. So we are like, well, we can have... This will be the beam. This will be yeah. the, the... Yeah, and then we will just erect the, the mass hole, after and boom. Wow. Sure. And Love yeah, it. we are like kind of investigating the size and I'm making drawings and we're thinking like we can build like a nice boat, but maybe maybe it would even fit to build like a cargo boat in here. <laughs> with like a little cargo hold and a forecastle for the crew and an aft cabin yeah. for, for ourselves. <laughs> so nice. uh, yeah, we started actually building this replica or kind of replica of a Dutch flat bottom cargo barge in uh, South Haven, Michigan. <laughs> you still need like lots of materials. How are you funding this? Well, actually, uh, I'm an artist as well. So I make drawings uh -huh. and with these uh, tall ship events, I have made like drawings of the ships there and sold them. So we got quite some money from that for, because those events, there's millions of people coming and they all want to take a souvenir. I was selling like these prints. And so we had quite a bit of money, maybe something like uh, $10,000 or so. Nice. And this um, is crazy. This is that same thing with, that you said way back that you were just like drawing sailing vessels and you're the old yeah, captain. Yeah, was, exactly. Wow. That's what this turned yeah. into. <laughs> very, very cool and then yeah. Um, yeah so then we we basically made a drawing of ship we were gonna build we, we pre-cut everything we built like a big model to show the local people how we're gonna build it and then like a local sawmill came in so mm -hmm. we launched this boat the 2nd of april and uh we uh, christened her the Perius magnus which is like a Frisian, uh, well, in the Netherlands, you have Friesland, which is in the north. It's kind of like a separate country, but it isn't a separate country. But it's kind of like with England and Scotland. And in England and Scotland, you have like Braveheart and stuff. And then in, uh, in Friesland, you have Grutte Pier. And that's like the big pier, Pierius Magnus. So we called the boat this way. And then we raked her. And I think it was May or so that we did our maiden voyage to um, the Tulip Festival in Holland, Michigan. <laughs> and, and so this was a cargo vessel. How big was this? How, how big did you guys go? So she was about, I think she was about 35 feet over the hull and about 52 feet overall. And she could take about 10 tons of cargo. So she had like a forecastle with two bunks and a stern uh, cabin with two bunks. And then she had like... Um, cargo hold of 10 tons and, wow, and she was rigged um, with one mast with a square rig uh, on it as well like uh, a square top sail square course and then she had a main sail and a couple of jibs so quite a <laughs> quite and, a little uh, uh, nice how little she sail uh yeah in the end those two of my friends they crossed the ocean with it wow. so um yeah, must be. Uh, she must have been some seaworthy little vessel. Yeah, <laughs> nice. but uh, no engine. So, um, Ooh. so and what yeah, sort of, of course, sailing rig did you guys give her? Was it a bar? So, uh, a... like a like a square rig sloop, basically. A sloop. Okay, tell us about a sloop. So we've heard bark. We've heard schooner. Sloop is. Yeah, sloop is one mast. Usually, a sloop is one mast without the jibboom. I think. And the cutter would be like uh, one mast with two head sails or more. And like a uh, sloop would be with one head sail. I, I guess that's the termination. Uh, so you, you kept boats. it simple though. Yeah, you kept it simple. Yeah, yeah. One okay. mast. Well, we had about uh, eight sails or so. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, if, if you're interested in it, there's... Um, hmm. Yeah, I wonder if you can find it. But, but there is a little... Uh, youtube movie about uh, building this boat and sailing it away it's like 20 years old so you see all these people like with beards and with like yeah it's it's a nice nice little Very movie cool. um Very cool I, I can send you the link <laughs> sure 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 we'll put it in there yeah. and so you you have this successful building of the boat and mm. you built this thing to carry cargo so your mind's on that now what happens next how do we get to eco clipper Oh, uh, a lot happens next. 
at a certain point I jumped ship from this Perius Magnus because we thought we were going to be two captains, but that didn't work out. So uh, I decided to go. In the meantime, I, I met somebody in Grand Rapids and we moved in together. Since I'm an artist as well, I did some art shows there and stuff and um, yeah, moved on. Basically, my visa ran out and I had to go anyway. So yeah, moved on and went back into um, working on motor ships because I needed to oh. yeah earn some money to actually to come back again or so to support yeah. your uh, but, uh, Spartan lifestyle, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I was working a bit on the motor cargo ships and then um, yeah, at a certain point I went. Um, I was back home with my parents and I went like to a movie theater with like a movie about the explorer Shackleton who went like to the South Pole like a hundred years ago or so. And when we came out of this movie theater, I'm like, wow, I really, really <laughs> would like to go there to Antarctica. And then about half an hour later, when I was back home, the telephone rang and it was um, Captain uh, Klaas Gastra, the captain of the Bark Europa. And uh, mm. he's like, yeah, I remember t two years ago, you crossed the ocean with us and you were actually making really nice drawings. And I'm mm. looking for a ship's artist to join the Bark Europa on a voyage from uh, San Diego to Easter Island, Rapa Nui, and then around Cape Horn to the Falkland Islands and from there to South Georgia and then back to oh. Terra del Fuego and from there an expedition to Antarctica. Woo, Would you like look to at join? that? Look at that. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. the universe sending you a message right there. Nice. Yeah, it was really amazing. I'm uh -huh. still thinking about this. But in the meantime, I had also, um, like, I had applied for the Royal Art School in uh, The Hague, and I was actually uh, invited to come there. So I had to choose, or I go to art school, or I go uh, sail around Ooh. Cape Horn. So, and, so for um, the artists in our community, like what, what is a gig like that first one you mentioned, you know, the onboard artist, what does that look like? Like you just have to give them a drawing a day so, or? Yeah, I was actually uh, supposed to make like drawings for a book about square rig seamanship. So uh -huh. basically um, a seamanship manual and uh, he was going to write it. I was going to make the drawings that that was kind of the idea. Yeah, I would just join the watches, but instead of doing maintenance or such, I would be making drawings. And then when uh, when there would be some sail handling or some uh, climbing the rigging or uh, anything like that, they would haul me on the deck to, to help them. But in the meantime, I, I'd be making drawings. So I did this trip and yeah, I came to Antarctica and this was also with all kinds of biologists and, and researchers. And, and then... It really hit me. It hit me right there that the world is so beautiful, but the way we are treating it as humans is kind of the way we are spoiling it and the environmental damage and all this. I really thought I want to do something about that. And then it kind of all linked together like, okay, one of the few things I know is, is sailing and working on ships. So why not really, really make this change happen of transition from motor to sail and um, just go and do everything what is possible to get rid of these motor ships and, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, distribute mm. all the cargo in the world with sailing mm. ships. Mm. And it seemed like a giant plan right then. Okay. And so how yeah. how'd you go about it? What'd you do? Then um, I kind of ended up on motor ships again. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Making a living. Yeah. But at a certain point, I was so fed up with it. And I got in contact again with my old uh, shipmates, who had by then crossed this little uh, Perius Magnus across the ocean. We said, okay, we're, we're actually going to take this on. We're going to bring back commercial uh, sailing ships on the high seas. It was 2007 then. In the meantime, I'd also built like a little 30-foot sailboat for myself because I was kind of done with, with industrial uh, civilization and just wanted to go away from it and just set sail and just go fishing or whatever. But yeah, then I came together with my two old shipmates and we decided, okay, we, we're going to do this. And then we started the company uh, Fair Transport. That was 2007. And the first thing we we're going to do was build a new uh, sail cargo ship, a big one. 
So maybe like 50 tons of cargo or 100 tons of cargo. <laughs> no, it's but just then, small. And then small is like giant for most people, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, Piri's Magnus was small. Like, a ship of 100 tons is really uh, it's still small. quite small. Like, yeah. like the one we are now we are now uh, yeah. working on, the Tucker. Mm. Uh, mm. She she can carry about 70 tons of cargo. The mm. ship by itself weighs about 120 tons. She has a length of 120 feet. And she is, in mm. the shipping world, really small, <laughs> mm. actually. Mm. Mm. Uh, if you this, compare this it... One need? She will sail with uh, five professional crew and 12 uh, paying guests. Yeah. Ooh. What? Wow. So back to the story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then we, um, yeah, we built this, uh, we actually uh, refitted this uh, vessel, uh, Tres Hombras, and uh, mm. we refitted her to become a brigantine, which is a two masted ship with one fore and aft rigged mast, the main mast, and the fore mast square rigged. And actually, the first thing we did when we purchased this hull, which is a story by itself, but the first thing we did was take the engine out to mm. really uh, make a statement make that a we point. were going to yeah. sell the ship. Wow. Yeah. And, so, but um, most people, they need an engine at least to like dock and undock. What happens in those situations? Yeah. So, well, when the situation is right, you can actually sail in and sail out. Yeah, uh, I agree and when with it's that. Not, so it's all about timing. Assistance. Uh, okay. Well, it's uh, it's circumstances, it's weather, it's timing, and it's location. Like not all locations are, uh, yeah, make it possible. Some do, but the more um, the more you come to more what they call uh, first world countries, the harder it becomes. <laughs> really interesting, interesting. Okay. Um, so then, <clears throat> so you pull the engine out. Yeah, we pulled the engine out, and we started refitting her. We had planned that it would take about a year, and it took in the end two and a half years. Mm. And then we, uh, yeah, on the maiden voyage, we sailed to uh, the climate conference in Copenhagen, and it was a huge success. She she sailed like a witch, really, really. Sailed really like a witch. I haven't before. heard that before. That's a good one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> then. And um, and yeah, then. Uh, then we were there. We had this beautiful brigantine sailing cargo ship, which could take about 40 tons of cargo, but we did not have any cargo. The logistics systems on this world weren't ready for sailing cargo ships. Mm. So then the, maybe you remember the earthquake in, in Haiti uh, in 2010. Mm. And then we decided, uh, okay, uh, if we don't have commercial cargo, we're just going to do something different. We reached out to some NGOs to ask what was needed there. Nice. And then we loaded the ship full with tents and with hospital materials, medicines, whatever you can f could think of. And uh, yeah, the winter of 2010, we uh, we set sail for Haiti. That was like a story by itself, of course. Mm, but um, mm, mm. after arriving, we did another voyage from Port-au-Prince to Jagmel with a cargo for the World Food Program. Because in Yakmel the roads all had been damaged, so it could only mm. be uh, distributed by small cargo ships. So did some sailing there, and then from there to the Dominican Republic. And we still didn't have uh, much more cargo, so we decided to buy our own cargo. We also had not much money, so I had stayed behind, and I called our all our investors and arranged some money to buy a cargo of rum, and we sailed that back across the ocean. And that became mm. the Tres Hombres rum, the famous Tres Hombres oh, rum brand. Wow. And started selling that. And and uh, that's that has become a kind of a tradition. The Tres Hombres mm. is still every year sailing a cargo of rum from the Caribbean to Europe. But also uh, other cargoes like coffee, like cacao, mm. like things like this. Mm. The ship has mm. been sailing for uh, yeah about 15 years 15 now, years. I think. Uh, and um, so at one point here, you mentioned that you had investors. And I guess that kind of gets into this next point. It's like, you know, the, it seems that the shipping industry is very much kind of focusing on technology. And it's like, what is the new technology that can make something sustainable? Where when we look at you, it's like you've gone back in time. It's like, mm. okay, this is sustainable. Can you talk on on that side of things? Yeah, it's just uh, using common sense, huh? <laughs> like um, you just look a little bit further into history 
and you just see thousands of commercial sailing ships who operated and actually arranged like a perfectly zero emission logistics system. Why wouldn't you use that again? And uh, actually those ships, they were like built throughout the knowledge of hundreds of thousands mm. of years. Mm. Maybe perfected. that's what we've lost, right? Is it, do, no, we, we, do we, we, have? we haven't lost it? We are, we're only not huh? using it. it it's mm. still there. The wind, the wind is still blowing there. Mm. It, it will continue blowing. Like, mm. this is one of the first questions people always ask me like, yeah, but sailing, it's, it's slower. Huh? It's slower. Mm. 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 How much slower though? Like, like now, now they're touting stuff like carbon fiber this and sails that and yeah, engine. Okay, but that that's yeah. very nice to make things lighter. But that yeah. doesn't work for cargo ships, because with cargo ships, the whole game is, of course, to carry weight, not to be as light as possible. But if you really look how long it takes to form fossil fuels, then all of a sudden sailing becomes really fast. Hmm. And actually, even if you look at at the passage times, then nowadays when you transport like a container from Asia to uh, Europe, it is about 30 or 40 days. If you're lucky, because there might be big traffic jams in the congested ports, etc. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and yeah, uh, you might be in that spot for another 30 days, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah. like the fastest uh, clipper ships, in the 19th century, they, they could sail that same route in, in 70 days or even mm. a longer route because they wouldn't take the Suez Channel. If you really want to go with the Paris uh, Climate Accords, if you really are serious about climate change or the other, the plastic soup or, or any of these crises, then you only have one choice for your logistics. If you want to continue using foreign goods and traveling to foreign lands, and sailing ships it is. Mm -hmm. And so what would you say, like a, a large fleet of smaller vessels or investing in bigger sailing vessels? What's the biggest the sailing vessel can go? Nowadays, the biggest sailing vessels, they might be like a couple of thousand tons. The biggest sailing vessel built was maybe the Prosen or so, the, well, the biggest square rig one at least, and could carry about 8,000 tons of cargo. I'd say that was built in 1904 or 1902. But nowadays, of course, they could be built bigger. I guess the average uh, container vessel is like 50,000 tons. So mm. that's quite a bit uh, bigger. But really what I propose, and this is something which is a bit weird maybe to hear from a ship owner, is to ship a lot less cargo. <laughs> about uh, about 30% yeah. of, of all the commodities uh, shipped over the world, of all the tons shipped, it's uh, fossil fuels. 30% okay. of what we send over the world. Yeah, I was going to say weight. toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> it's fossil fuels. That's being brought by tankers yeah. and by big bulk carriers. I believe and Then you. of the rest, of course, 90% uh, of, of the rest, what, what is being shipped, it's only being shipped because it's for uh, manufacturers. It's mm. easier to uh, produce it in some Asian countries because there's no environmental laws there's no uh, labor laws. There's nothing like that, or maybe, or a lot less laws than than we have in the USA or in in Europe. So mm. that that's of course the reason a lot of our industry went abroad because that shipping, mm. especially with container ships, is so efficient, is so cheap. Mm. Nowadays, garbage is being shipped all around the world to be sent to Africa or so. That, and it's not because Africa shows already how good ridiculous way it all is. to deal with garbage is just because that's the new dumping site, right? And yeah. so, so what, what are you recommending though? It's like everybody, like I was reading this thing about like New Zealand honey, and they they charge like a hundred times more than any other honey or whatever. I don't remember the name, but uh, is it something like that? Like everybody just picks a super niche and just sticks with it? Is that what you're saying? And everything else that oh. you can grow, you just grow. Yeah, or, of course, we need to be localized way more. And, Much more um, localization. And what about yeah, the trash and then? This can, so you're saying we can't ship the trash. What are you supposed to do with the, all the trash? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where do, where do we put it? Like yeah. maybe, yeah. again, just consume less, no, I maybe, guess, right? Maybe we could eat the trash. What about that? It recycles more. That? Right? Well, compost it, right? That's something they're coming up with. 
So yeah. um, obviously, it seems that the you know the shipping side and using the fossil fuels is quite entrenched into kind of the the modern day logistics. So in terms of you know sailing cargo ships where is the clipper industry now you know what would have to happen in order to scale that industry and you know i guess going off that how you see this sailing cargo happening over the next five to ten years yeah so first like after we launched uh, tres hombres that was kind of like a pioneer and then uh, many uh, new projects uh, followed so maybe now there's about 15 sailing cargo ships sailing around and even more wind uh, assist ships so they have like they still have engines but they also use wind to have like less fuel use and less emissions and also about maybe about 10 years ago or maybe a little bit less the International Windship Association was formed. And this is like a market organization for the industry. It has its main office in London. And now I think there's about 100 members. And that's not only small companies like our company, like EcoClipper, but also, uh, yeah, big companies, big shipping companies who are looking into using wind power. Yeah, I think actually the, the, um, yeah, if we are serious about environment, if we are serious about climate change, then this is the only way forward. So that will, if we really act upon that, upon all that, then we are in for some sailing ships. But um, it can also happen that it kind of business as usual, where we kind of say, okay, we really find uh, green important, but in the meantime, we just fly all over the place. That's the mm. most likely thing what will happen. Um, <laughs> and we see it happening all the time, of course, uh, since... Uh, uh, the, the movie Inconvenient Truth came out. Yeah, yeah, but apparently, and, apparently um, Greta Thunberg goes around uh, in sailing vessels to the client conferences. Yeah, it's climate, yeah. right. So well, that, that's, that's a great a, example. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, good, no, it's for, good. for that. Right, yeah. and it's that, cool that because really good. It, it's sort of it's again, it's just showing to the world that we like what where where are we rushing to? Like where are we going? Yeah, you know, like what's like just enjoy the passage there well, or whatever. You um, you definitely see a change, of course, but it's still mm, niche, huh? Mm, but but I niche. must admit. About 15 years ago, when I talked to somebody about sailing cargo ships, people were like, well, mm. well, 90% of the, of the people are like, you're mm. absolutely nuts. You're absolutely mm. crazy. Mm. This cannot happen. And now I'm actually on your podcast. So well, <laughs> that's, that's a well, huge change. Huh? It is. It is. Uh, but, right? um, just podcasts didn't but, exist. But I don't know what you think, of yeah. course. <laughs> um, no, I, I agree. And so tell me this. So lots of people... Like say say somebody wanted to join a board like this really sort of gets them all invigorated and they're like oh I want to change the world too I want to sail aboard a sailing vessel I think what might freak out some of them is that but it's so dangerous or something right compared to like but is that true compared to like a motor vessel or would it be the same sailing experience anyway I think it's safer safer oh I love to hear this side tell me more. <laughs> Well, you can look at the scientific papers, but at the motor vessel, you have an engine, which is a huge cause of um, of fires on board uh, mm, vessels. Ninety percent of fires, yeah, <laughs> started in engine rooms. Yeah, right? it, it's true. Huh? <laughs> about I think about sixty percent of the fires on the yeah. vessel they start in the engine room. Sixty. Okay, um, okay. But anyhow, when you have a good, well-found sailing vessel. You can just ride the winds, uh, w work with the nature in g instead of against it. Mm. When you lose power with a motor vessel, yeah, you're really lost. But with the a end, sailing yeah. vessel, even if, if a sail tears, you, you often have more sails. Huh? It was not for nothing that in the 19th century, when the steamships came up, it took about 70 years or so that even steamships were obliged to still have sails because it wasn't deemed safe to just go to no sea way. without sails. That's interesting. And uh, why do you think that people have made such a shift from, you know, obviously mm. it started off as sales and then, you know, it moved to steam and then it moved to diesel and, you know, talking to people in the shipping side of the industry, how they describe it is it's like right before the advent of steam, like trying to figure out how to exactly do anything to make anything sustainable and new forms of transportation. Sorry, what is exactly the question? Ah, you see, that's the problem. Mm, Basically, the yeah, yeah uh, you know what the the trends of sustainability and shipping. How does that impact like the wider economy? How does sailing cargo ships impact 
local economies. Well, it can have a huge positive impact, actually. But it all depends how you work it out, of course. With sailing ships, we are able to actually work on an, on a new tradition in shipping, which can be done actually with smaller vessels and also asking the true ecological price for freight, for a transport. We'll kind of sift through what cargo should be really transported and what cargoes are actually ridiculous to transport. They are not worth to be transported. You just will have less transport, but only valuable cargoes who are, who are worth to be transported. And then what could actually happen if we organize it politically well is that small ports become actually commercial ports again. And instead of having like, well, what happened after the Second World War is that our governments, they decided to invest heavily in road transport against waterborne transport. And if we could change that around, actually we could take some traffic jams off the roads and mm. we could actually have some way more efficient, less energy use by moving transport to ships. And also having like small ports become economical centers again, where there is thriving business. Like you see a lot of small ports here in Europe. I don't know how it's in the USA where the old warehouses are turned into apartment buildings. And that, of course, all needs to be reversed again to make actually the ports working ports again. And also the cities have people work and live at the same place and not having to commute for like an hour or so because it just doesn't make sense in a time where, where we talk about climate change. But even more, maybe, because climate change... It's also kind of, a, in a way, a psychological thing. Like people can just kind of say like, wow, look how it storms. It's, uh, well, look how cold it is. It's not really happening. And that, that's kind of the, the general idea, I guess. I, I'd be happy if it changes, but I'm also a bit surprised. <laughs> but what will happen is that the price of energy will go up and it mm -hmm. will keep going up. That's something you cannot uh, just say, okay, well, look, it is snowing. Nothing is happening. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. if you see how much it is, then you want to do something different and maybe you actually want to stop using fossil fuels hmm. and use sailing vessels. Hmm. Tell me, as an investor, how much, say I wanted to get into you know, sailing vessels, sailing shipping vessels, what are the best places to start? Is it is it like country specific or some countries better at it than others? Yeah. How much capital would somebody need? What sort of experience does somebody need to get into this? So for investors who are looking for investing in sailing cargo vessels, well, you can always, of course, send uh, EcoClipper a line. And, uh, exactly, exactly. Right? <laughs> because First we are line. still looking for investors. Although hmm. there is something here I need to uh, tell. And I haven't found out a way yet, but in the Netherlands, there's some sort of law where it's harder for U.S. or uh, Canadian investors to invest in EcoClipper. So... Sorry, I'm, I'm still mm. looking for a solution there. But there mm. is, of course, other projects. Like, for example, there is this great project in Costa Rica, Sail Cargo, and they are actually building this 350, foot, 350 tons schooner on the mm. beach in Costa Rica. So there's projects like this you could invest in. There's more projects around uh, the world. Just go online and look for Sail Cargo or look for um, clean transport or... Well, Eco Clipper, of course. And then, of course, I would invite people to start their own sailing cargo companies. Ooh. But right, that'd yeah, be the coolest. for this, there's also a disclaimer because mm. uh, it is quite some work. It's quite intricate. There's a lot of different things you have to think about. So mm. if you want to start a sail cargo company, it's probably better to start as a mariner first on different sailing ships to kind of learn the trade. Uh, maybe sail on a couple of sail cargo ships. Nowadays, you can just book a trip on, uh, well, on our ship, but also on other ships mm. like uh, Tres Ombras, like the Aventure, like uh, Galand. Like, there's many ships sailing around now where you can just book a berth and just try it out. Even better, of course, is just go work professionally on as many ships as you can. Just get a career in shipping, learn about shipbroking, learn about maritime economics and then go into it. And um, I think then you're really paving your way to a great career because, mm. uh, yeah, there's no way around it. Sooner or later, the logistics will uh, will change to wind power because if we want to continue long-distance uh, transport and travel, that's the only feasible solution. 
we had a discussion with this one guy, Drew Oriento, and uh, he was basically, he had done a program and they had the design of a cargo ship and they were like, okay, can you put sails on this thing? Like, you know, jerry rig this thing. And clearly that was like a no. And so it's like a situation in which a lot of boats would have to be built. Do you foresee these major shipping companies being like, okay, you know what, we're going to go with the we're going to start making some moves, start building out some sailing ships, or are they just going to invest their money into like alternative fuels and whatnot? Yeah, well, th- there is actually some some shipping companies that do invest in sail, but it's only a few. And I'm afraid most shipping companies and big shipping companies are, are just missing the turn here. And they start thinking about biofuels or so, mm-hmm. which uh, which is of course a huge drain on on agricultural land. Yeah, but it's coming uh, well, from the same it, place that caused the problem, right? Yeah, so it can't work. And then there's yeah. of course the yeah the idea of selling electrical, but mm. that's a huge problem with uh, well how to store it. So it's also not feasible. Then there's the idea of using uh, hydrogen. But hydrogen, you need to somehow make it. It's basically an energy battery. So you have to still produce it. And to produce that, it costs a lot of energy. But yeah, of course, you can use green energy. So then what you're doing, you're actually putting down windmill farms. You get, you're making electricity of that wind. Then you make hydrogen of that electricity. Hmm. Then you somehow get the hydrogen on the ship. And hmm. then you start sailing with it. Mm. Well, if you look at efficiency, that's that's about the worst efficiency mm. you can find. Why not put mass on a ship right away? Mm. But somehow the coin isn't really falling yet, but it can come any moment. Of course, mm. it should. We, we're not all idiots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and you're ahead of the curve that way. So, yeah, good luck to you. I mean, it sounds like quite an adventure you've been on you know, these last 20, 30 years more. It's really cool to hear all those stories, man. Anything you'd like to leave our listeners with any you know top tips yeah you know, from all your experience well i would say um yeah really uh, really find ways to start making use of sailing vessels so for charterers look for sailing vessels to uh, to put your goods on if you want to travel look for sailing vessels to travel with instead of using an airplane if you're interested in investing look for sailing cargo ship companies to invest in i think uh, that that is definitely the way forward of course on the industry of long uh, distance logistics so where can people find you and read more about what you're doing and check out everything that you're working on yeah so it's eco clipper you can find it on online, of course, ecoclipper.org is our website. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Insta, uh, LinkedIn. Even on the website, you can find my telephone number and give me a call. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to uh, discuss any ways to make the transition to sail faster. Awesome, Jordan. It was great talking to you and hearing all these stories. Thanks so well, much thank you very show, much. Man. Thank you for, uh, for hosting me here. And um, fair winds. Ahoy. Peace. Check back every Tuesday for our latest episode and be sure to like, share and subscribe to Shipshape.pro. Pro, 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 pro.